Welcome back to another installment of Julian's Random Projects. Uh, today we're taking a dive into the world of uh, photography. Uh, I know we've previously on the channel you've followed along while we built out the uh, the new camera after the, uh, the the older one I was using broke. And the new camera's got interchangeable lenses and those can get very expensive. And so I started to Google around and to, of course check YouTube for alternatives to expensive lenses. And what I found was this trend of uh, vintage lenses and all, all the cool kids want uh, old glass uh, is another thing that's popular. Like any of these kids know the difference between old glass and new glass, I doubt it. There is something to be said about finding lenses that came from someone's, you know, old dad's collection of Canon A1 uh, photography bag or you know this is old Minolta that no one uses anymore. Oh, this is a film camera and so they're just uh, getting rid of it for really cheap. Um, eBay's sort of caught on and there's some niches there that you still have to look for to find a deal but generally again out in garage sales, yard sales and the like you can find some amazing deals. Uh, as, an, as an example I recently found uh, this lens here. It's kind of goofy and big. I didn't think much of it. it messing with it I could see that there was numbers down in there, but they were a bit hard to see. And then I realized that this is a noisy sun shield for this lens. And I also noticed it was a little goofy. I hadn't, hadn't seen lenses a lot uh, in photography with the center thing. Now I know from messing around with telescopes in grade school uh, that this is some sort of reflective mirror lens. And kind of find out this and its brother, who's uh, recently gone up on eBay. The other, the other lens is like a thousand dollar plus lens that I picked up at a yard sale and this one here is you know goes for a few hundred bucks or or north uh, depending on who you get it from the condition etc 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 so going like so and with this one here you can get some amazing like telescopic photographs from like miles and miles away here's one that I took of uh, you know, a building that's clear across town uh, from the hill that we're on and the other fun thing about this is, you know, messing around with a, an, a DSLR is that I've got all these manual controls. So with the naked eye, you cannot see this building or anything else. There's just a couple specks of light over there uh, that represents some of the street lights. But when you drop the exposure way, way, way down and open up the aperture, I guess this, this one actually has a fixed aperture, I think. But uh, you start messing around with some of the settings and give yourself some patience and a tripod and you get some amazing photos. So uh, keep an eye out for that. So I bought all of those. I bought this one and like three or four of these other lenses in one big uh, bundle for 40 bucks. So this brings us to the subject of today's video, which is these old uh, Russian lenses. I picked these up. Uh, they're actually Ukraine. I tease that they're, they're Russian. Uh, and they're very popular in Russia, but I, these explicit ones I got from Ukraine. Uh, and if you guys haven't visited Ukraine, put it on your list, okay? If you hear people talking about Ukraine, oh, it's war-torn, and wait, wait, don't, why would you go there? Do not believe the hype, okay? The place was amazing. I've been there a few times. Uh, the food's great. The people are warm and welcoming, which is a, a trend I've noticed uh, in all of my travels around the world, that um, no matter how horrible or backwards uh, some country is perceived to be uh, by the media, it's filled with wonderful people that are super pleased to have met you. So don't believe the hype. Go there. It kind of reminds me, there's a scene in... Um, in Euro Trip, when they go to like some weird Slavic country, and the the, the main characters are stuck somewhere, and they're like, oh, I don't know how we're gonna get home. I've only got you know three dollars and eighty four cents or something, and they're you know pulling their you know wads of uh, coins and cash out of their pockets, and they cut to a scene of them like having eating lobster and enjoying the finest that this this country has to offer. Uh, so it's it's a lot like that. I, I think I took uh, an entire team of people out for a Michelin quality uh, type experience at a restaurant uh, with crazy hors d'oeuvres and decadent meats and drinks. And everyone's drinking the whole night through. We we're probably there for like three or four hours, closed the place out. And I wanna say us, uh, probably 10, 12 people uh, in attendance. In total, the whole night, 300 bucks. I, I had to double check and Google the conversion rate to make sure I wasn't stiffing these guys or showing our ass and that kind of stuff. So even after tip, it was it was not a lot. So keep that in mind when you're traveling to these places. Ton of fun. Why would you start talking about that? All right, lenses. So <laughs> these came from uh, Ukraine, and you know something that might have been discarded or, or or otherwise is being recycled here because 
the they're still using this uh, Leica was M39. What is this? L39. Sorry, L39 uh, thread style. And again, I I, got it. I don't know a lot about cameras or lenses. So when you hear this stuff, uh, don't think that I, you know, I'm some sort of expert on this stuff. I, I have to Google everything that, that I see here, like uh, these lenses being, uh, you know, PK lenses. I don't know what that is, you know, so I've gotta, I've gotta look it up. And then discover that it's a Pentax version of some lens or Minolta or MD or EF to F. Like again, Google is your friend when it comes to lenses or Amazon for that matter. A lot of the, the adapters here, I've just picked up from, from Amazon and bless their hearts, uh, there are some machinists out there that recognize that this is just some aluminum and maybe a little bit of uh, inexpensive steel here and some standard measurements that are been probably published by the uh, manufacturer, in this case, Canon on this side and some um, old threaded version of a lens. There's also uh, these type, which drop all the way down to C-mount. C-mount super popular right now with folks that are doing what I'm doing, uh, which is trying to find old lenses and repurpose them. So you get something like one of these guys, and then it's still an MD mount here. And of course, I've turned off autofocus because it was bouncing around all because of the glossy um, material here. So MD to C-mount. And then I happen to have a C-mount to EOS or EOS M for the Canon. So it's like, it's, you know, transitioning through this and popping back out. It's doing a lot of goofy stuff. But the reason you get away with this is because the mirrorless lenses, when they went from um, SLRs, which are, you know, letting you see what the world is in the, through the viewfinder and out through the actual lens. And that's what made these things amazing. It's like what you see is what you're about to get when you click that trigger. And when you click the trigger, it's flapping a lens, or not a lens, I should say, a mirror and redirecting it to the film and then flipping back up again. So it's like, you know, sent through the glass, giving exposure to the film, actual 35 millimeter film, and then flipping back. And that is how SLRs were taking photos. Now they're, they're getting rid of the mirror function and they're bumping that sensor right up against the lens. And so you, with some ad simple adapt adapters and no smarts in between, it, although, for modern cameras, there there is a middle ground. So I'm dealing with stuff that has no smarts to it, meaning that we're just dealing with a mechanical connection here, a, a mechanical connection that goes from this lens up against the sensor. Now, some have little gold or uh, copper pads here to interface with and drive motors that exist inside the lens to do uh, auto focusing and, and and aperture settings and these types. Um, those also exist. You can get adapters for that, but I'm not dealing with that just yet partly because it gets a little bit more expensive uh, to, to delve into that. Now, another thing to keep in mind is the, some of these aperture like resetting toggles where you can like, you know, from a, the camera operates this, or maybe you smoothly do something in the camera and it moves this little uh, lever here. The challenge here is that depending what's this guy or some of these that are more pronounced that stick out quite a bit. If you go, if you put this into some kind of an adapter, so I'll use this one to be a little bit more dramatic here. Uh, if you're adapting this to your camera and you've got one of these mirrorless cameras that we're messing around with today and you put some sort of adapter on and it happens to fit, I meaning it goes in here, clicks in place, it's fine. But this lever or this lens protecting extrusion here is so proud of that adapter, meaning it sticks up above it, that it ends up touching your sensor, you are ruining a thousand dollar camera right off the bat or scratching up, up and around it at best. And so be mindful of that. If you put an adapter on here, take a look at it in this orientation and make sure that it's not sticking up above where the adapter goes uh, to be safe. So word to the wise. All right, so the meaning of today's video is that I've got the two of these and now I've lost track of which one's which. Let's see. Yeah, this one actuates relatively smoothly it's got some nice color, has a dent, that's fine. So because it was smooth, it's the one that I ended up using with my adapter here. But I hedged my bets and I got an identical one from the same supplier. Again, bundling these things, buying a set of three or four lenses, you're likely to get a deal because someone else is looking for a specific lens and they're like, well, I want just that one. I don't want all that extra gunk or the extra junk that comes along with it. And 
in some of those cases, because there's a lot, of, there's less eyeballs on it, you can get the lens they were looking for for less than they paid, and you still got some extra lenses. Or you get this for exactly what it's worth, and the other ones come for free. So you can play these types of bundling games, uh, and I'm really glad folks bundle stuff. It occasionally uh, stands to get you a good a good deal on that. So this other one is like much more stiff. I'm applying quite a bit of force. Now the aperture setting, it goes, uh, but this is a lot stiffer. Now I could be really um, conservative and just brush this down, make sure that I get all the different uh, bits of uh, lint and the other foreign objects and debris out of here from the the moving pieces, the uh, any, any of the parts that might interface and touch touch each other. Just get all that out of there. Uh, and then drop the tiniest bit of oil, just like a single drop here, and then work it in. You don't want it to get on the lenses or work its way through and actually get on the glass. It would you know would ruin this thing. It would be really hard to clean up. But the other thing I'm interested in doing, and again, I've got a, set, a backup in case I screw this one up, is another, another popular mod for these is to get rid of that detent, get rid of that click. Uh, apparently for uh, video photography, you're just trying to slowly transition that you walk you know, in from outside, it's bright outside, you walk into a darker garage or uh, room, you want to transition. And if you want to maintain it without getting that obvious thunk, 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 and then re-exposure, balance, and then it's there, uh, which kind of takes people out of, it reminds them that it's being filmed by a camera person. So uh, you want that to be a little bit smoother. So a common mod is to go in and declickify or get rid of the clicker that's in there. And I don't know if that, I, there's not a tutorial for this particular type of lens, but if I can get in there and it's obvious what's clicking, I'll remove it. And while I'm also in there, I'm gonna clean this thing up and uh, lube it and try and get it back together as best we can. So let's uh, take a crack at that. I think that turned out quite well. Uh, I was trying to focus it with the camera set where you are now, and I, I couldn't get it. I was like, oh, maybe I've you know, missed a cog. You know, when I put it back together, I'm you know, one set of teeth off or you know, one set of threads in the wrong rotation. And I figured oh, I'll just kind of wrap up this video and say we'll look at it later. And then I backed the camera up just to get it into focus to see if I could salvage something. And when I did, it, it opened it wide up, it really established a focal distance from somewhere about here. You'd move the ring just a little bit and it would swing focus from here. We got autofocus on now with the modern with the modern lens. So it'd, it'd be focusing something like around here and then you could quickly pop over to middle and then swing out to the back side. Uh, you just bam, 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 all the way through that. And you know, just a little bit of turning. So. Uh, I should, I'm sure there's a technical term for that. Uh, if you know what it is, I'll leave it down in the description. And I was very pleased with it. I think it made some cool effects. It means that you can set something up, especially small stuff like this, that I'm, you know, intricate things I'm working on. If I wanna be artsy fartsy about it in my YouTube videos, I'll be able to really tightly focus on what I'm doing here and then have sort of a, a, a blurred background because your brain doesn't pay attention to stuff that's a bit out of focus. It, it draws your eye into what we're trying to, the subject of what we're talking about. So I think it's gonna work out really, really well for some of these videos. Now, the challenge is that it is a manual focused lens and it's now about you know more than an arm's length away from where I'm actually working. So this is gonna be one of the things that maybe I set up um, for some B-roll or with a second camera, that kind of a thing. So. Uh, I do have uh, an old Hero 4 that I've 
considered modifying. They sell these cages for these that remove a, a number of the outer uh, beauty covers for this and the lens and then give you a aluminum ectoskeleton, if you will, and the ability to screw in um, C-mount lenses is, is one of the popular ones. And that's because a C-mount's about that diameter and wouldn't you know it, it's real close to what was already in there. So you're not really um, making a massive stretch there. And they make adapters that do about this, you know, or that give you a new threaded spot that's real close to the body of the camera so they can get the sensor and the lens right up next to each other like they're designed to be. So uh, that might be for your future video. But the, the challenge with that is, you know, me, with the, the guy with the YouTube channel, is that if I go with the route of buying one of those kits, which are now effectively discontinued for this brand, they have the kit for more modern cameras because that's their business making newer and newer ones as, as GoPro comes out. This is a number of years old now. Uh, I could find one of those on eBay, the kit to convert this. Then I do the labor with you guys looking over my shoulder and we have a cool video. The less expensive option right now is to buy an already modded camera that you know has the ectoskeleton, the labor's already included, and some assortment of lenses that went with it, uh, whether it's locally on an app or on eBay. So I'm torn. If I really want one of those things and we want to kind of review what it's like to use, the more affordable route is just to go buy one. That's you know the Hero 4, a couple years old, someone's already upgraded and they're looking to recoup some of that cost. If I'm looking for a nifty how-to, I don't know who that how-to's for, it's a number of years old now. I'm kind of talking myself out of it, but the uh, you know the, these are the kinds of things that I, I, I think about and I, I struggle with as a, as a YouTuber. So um, let me know down in the description. You guys want to see the labor done, the actual work of you know converting this to another camera or a camera that accepts different lenses, uh, or are you interested in what you can do with a already converted GoPro? Let me know. So now with a with a, a very buttery smooth uh, focal lens here. I wasn't able to declickify it, as you can see. Uh, I've got pretty deep in it. At one point you saw we were messing with the tool to try and take the lenses out and get deeper in. And at some point I had, you know, had to you know, cut my losses and uh, avoid breaking this thing to get into it. And luckily I had two, but um, it wasn't obvious of how to get much deeper and I don't need it to be uh, not clicky. It just was a nice to have while I was in there. But in pulling out all of that thick grease and you know now, uh, which is you know a very aged uh, grease that was put in before, it started to kind of separate and got really thick. It was almost like a thick, thick wax uh, that was in there. Great for preserving the thing and keeping it from rusting out. Um, all this isn't made out of like rustable materials necessarily. It's aluminum. It would just oxidize a little bit, but. Um, it did a great job of protecting that lens. I pulled all of that out and replaced it with what's effectively some sewing machine oil. Anyways, it's, it's that oil there has done a wonder for this particular lens and it's really, really smooth now. Those letters turned out really, really nice. I just you know got in there with some isopropyl alcohol and scrubbed away a bunch of the, the years of people's dirt and debris because you know they're, they're machined into this thing, which is another thing of beauty is uh, th this is before CNC machines, or maybe just after CNC machines. Um, I'm not sure what technique was used with this, whether it was like a, a scribe that was connected to a larger uh, number 11, and then as it moved through, it just moved a, a rod that had a, a spinning, um, you know, grinding uh, point, like a stylist that ground away these things. I don't know. And, and then add the further complication that this thing's rotating like this to get that done. I mean, it's, um, it's amazing um, for, you know, for something built in like the early 50s or, or before. So God only knows. If you've gotten a kick out of this video and you hope to catch more from Julian's random projects, uh, make sure you subscribe and clicking the bell apparently helps uh, with the Google and the uh, YouTube algorithms. So uh, make with the clicky clicky uh, and let us know down in the descriptions if you found this thing useful or fun. Thanks for watching. I'm hanging in, there ain't no doubt, and I'm hanging tough over and out, over and out.